We're back with the second part of Lecture 26 on 1960s protest and political change. While Johnson was stepping aside, the Democratic Party ran Hubert Humphrey for pre the presidency in 1968. The Democratic Party was splintering badly, however, over the issue of the Vietnam War. They were also suffering from a lot of bad press, as the party's convention that year in Chicago featured riots. Mayor Daley had to deploy the Illinois National Guard with tear gas. Beatings ensued in the street. So again, for many middle-class white Americans who are considering uh, who they want for their next president, they see some of the violence associated with the Democratic convention that year, and they turn instead to the Republican nominee. The Republican nominee for the presidency in 1968 will be former Vice President Richard Nixon. Nixon will capitalize on the fears of many middle-class white Americans in the run-up to the election in 1968. Nixon played on the concerns of people who were worried about anti-war protests, um, the rising hippie movement and uh, increasing levels of drug use among the younger generation. He's going to, to look at all of that and he's going to offer himself in stark contrast as someone that will restore law and order in the United States if elected to the White House. Further, Nixon claimed that a so-called silent majority of Americans would support his policies over that of his Democratic competitor. He claimed that it was the loud minority of troublemakers that were covered on TV. It was the, the hippies, it was the anti-war protesters, it was those causing rioting in the streets, that they were actually a very loud but, but small number of Americans that were disrupting uh, the harmony of the United States during this period. He claimed, however, that there was a silent majority of Americans who wanted to see uh, everything sort of go back to normal. We will also see a third party candidate uh, entering the race for the presidency in 1968, the former segregationist governor of Alabama, George Wallace. Perhaps you remember our discussion of him several lectures ago. He'll be running as a third party nominee under the American Independence Party in 1968. That will drain some southern white votes away from both parties, but Richard Nixon will end up being the winner of the 1968 presidential contest. But he only wins with a very narrow margin, 0.7%. And in his inaugural address, he spoke of, quote, black and white together as one nation, not two. But it's still going to be a rocky road ahead for race relations under his time in office. Another difficult matter that now President Nixon will have to grapple with during his time at the White House will be what to do about the Vietnam War. This war was highly unpopular with the majority of Americans. It had been going on now for years with no end in sight. The policy that Nixon will adopt will be twofold. Uh, first, to invade the neighboring country of Cambodia, which the United States intelligence community believed was offering aid and cover to the enemy, the Viet Cong. So the United States will begin taking policies to expand the war into the neighboring country of Cambodia. And then also, the second prong in his war strategy was to gradually withdraw American troops from Vietnam. In order for him to fight communism, though, there needed to be a replacement for American troops. Because remember, Nixon is just as much a cold warrior as Johnson had been before him, or Kennedy or Eisenhower. All right, so Nixon, the second part of his war policy will be the process known as Vietnamization of the war. So his policy was to slowly withdraw U.S. troops from on the ground and in the process train more South Vietnamese troops to shoulder the burden of fighting. He believed, quote, as South Vietnamese forces become stronger, the rate of American withdrawal can become greater, unquote. Only a month 
After the invasion of Cambodia, however, in early 1970, anti-war protests flared again in the United States. Specifically, in May of 1970, four Kent State University students were killed and nine were injured when the Ohio National Guard opened fire to disperse an anti-war rally on that campus. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the last of the violence surrounding the anti-war movement in the United States. Just two days after the Kent State Massacre, as it becomes known, at the University of Buffalo, police wounded four more demonstrators. And on May 15th, city and state police killed two and wounded 12 at Jackson State College, now Jackson State University, in Mississippi. Another area of mass protest by the late 1960s and early 1970s was the women's rights movement in the United States. While women now enjoyed the right to vote, and they had since 1920, uh, there were still abundant problems, especially in the workplace. Women routinely received far less pay for the same work as their male counterparts. Women were subject to sexual harassment in the workplace with no, no sort of, of protection for women. Uh, there was a so-called glass ceiling. The sexism prevented women from achieving the higher ranks in the business world. Legally speaking, for women in merit, difficult marriages, there was no such thing as a no-fault divorce. A woman basically had to prove wrongdoing on the part of her husband in order to just simply part ways with this person legally. In higher education, women were forcibly kept out of graduate schools. As one medical school dean declared, Hell yes, he said, we have a quota. We do keep women out when we can. We don't want them here, and they don't want them there elsewhere whether or not they'll admit it." Unquote. So we see a younger generation of women who are increasingly frustrated that they either can't get out of bad marriages or they can't advance in their work, uh, in the work world, they can't make more money, they can't be admitted to law school or medical school. How would they change this situation? So we start to see groups like NOW or the National Organization for Women coalescing by 1966 and many of their key issues will be trying to address uh, equal pay, and an end to gender discrimination in the workplace, an end to sexual harassment, uh, and we will see a strong support among legislators in Congress as well by the early 1970s to support a so-called Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. The Equal Rights Amendment was simply going to be a proposed constitutional amendment that would protect women's rights. In other words, it would call out by name and say that women were um, protected by the Constitution in the same way that all male citizens were protected by the Constitution. We will see a strong backlash against the ERA. We will see a strong backlash against now and some of the push for women's rights, though, among not just men, but women in the United States as well. And some of this uh, gets mixed in with the push for homosexual rights during this period. Uh, uh, even though this was a blending of two different groups, we will see, especially among conservative Christians in the United States, they will begin to kind of conflate uh, the get burgeoning gay rights movement uh, with the fight for women's rights, specifically the fight for legal abortions. All of this social change happening in such a short period of time, you see many conservatives that just don't like it. It's too much change in too short a period of time. And so they will begin campaigning against it. So the Equal Rights Amendment will never be ratified. It falls short of the, uh, the number of states that it needed to actually be added to the U.S. Constitution. Another issue that will become very polarizing in the United States will be the issue of should women have access to medical abortions. Many states prohibited uh, women's access to a medical abortion, that is one that was performed by a medically licensed doctor in a sterile environment. 
what this forced many women to do, therefore, since it was illegal to procure this medical procedure, was you have a number of so-called back alley abortions, uh, women seeking to terminate their pregnancy in um, less than sterile conditions. Uh, women will die in large numbers, therefore, of infection or of botched procedures at the hands of people who were not uh, medically trained professionals. Ultimately, the federal government in the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court case will side on the right of women having the constitutional right to procure a medical abortion. This decision will incite a strong backlash, especially among Christian conservatives who argued that it was legalized murder. Meanwhile, advocates of Roe argued that countless women seeking abortions were dying, and no one seemed to care about that. Yet more controversial issues will arise under Nixon's two terms as president. Nixon was elected the first time in 1968, and he will be re-elected for a second time in 1972. As Nixon was preparing for a second run for the presidency in 1972, we will see that there will be some individuals associated with Nixon's re-election campaign that will break the law. A number of individuals trying to aid President Nixon will break into the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. in 1972. They will break into the opposition's headquarters, the, the DNC's headquarters, and they will put wiretaps on so that they can listen to their political opponents on the phone as they strategize for the upcoming election. They will steal documents as well. Um, and what we're going to end up seeing is when an investigative journalist digs into this after Nixon has already been reelected, uh, we will see that this turns into a massive scandal for the Nixon presidency. Over time, as more evidence came out, it became clear that Nixon, while he may not have known about the initial Watergate espionage op operation, he certainly took steps to cover it up after the fact and to protect his reputation and presidency. For instance, evidence came to light that he raised hush money for the burglars to buy their silence. He and his aides hatched a plan to instruct the CIA to impede the FBI's investigation of the crime. This was way more serious than the initial break-in. This was an abuse of presidential power. A president cannot choose to pit one federal agency, in this case the CIA, against another federal agency, the FBI. Nixon also helped to destroy evidence and fired uncooperative staff members. He refused to hand over recordings of phone conversations made in the White House, that is, until the Supreme Court ordered him to do so. All through this process, Nixon adamantly maintained his, intimates, his innocence, saying, I am not a crook. The evidence said otherwise. In August of 1974, after his role in the Watergate conspiracy had finally come to light in the press, the president resigned office. His successor, Gerald Ford, immediately pardoned Nixon for all the crimes he committed while in office, meaning that Nixon, because of this new presidential pardon, was not going to see a day's time in jail for all of his illegal activities. Although Nixon was never prosecuted, the Watergate scandal changed American politics forever, leading many Americans to question their leadership and to think much more critically about the presidency. And the Watergate scandal is not the first time the American public has grown suspicious and disillusioned by their president. We've discussed, for example, Johnson's uh, conduct during Vietnam and how his escalation of the war and his promises that he made that the war was, was winnable uh, became known, obviously, as a lie after the Tet Offensive. Uh, and so here we see with this long, drawn-out Watergate scandal that Nixon keeps saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm not a crook, only to be found out that he was lying the whole time to the American public. You put all these pieces together, and we're seeing over time this gradual uh, disillusionment. Uh, the American public is becoming ever more jaded that not only their president, but their, their elected officials at all levels might not be, be uh, truthful with them at all times.